Great. And I think that we are live now. So I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for our presentation on arbitrating IP matters and really focusing on how we can maximize the advantages of the arbitral forum. My name is Thomas Allen, and I'll be joined by Wes Overson. We are both partners at Kilpatrick Townsend, and we specialize in, in large part on the international arbitration of disputes. Uh, I do a wide variety of commercial disputes and IP disputes, and I think Wes will describe a little bit more about his background as he gets going. So with that, let's, let's get started. And I'd like to just briefly cover what we'll be talking about today, and I'm going to introduce the topics, and then I'm going to turn it over to Wes for some detailed discussion on each of these. First, we're going to discuss what are some of the drivers for why parties choose international arbitration of IP disputes. We're also going to talk in detail about the pros and cons of utilizing arbitration for IP disputes. Wes is going to take us through some case examples, as well as some lessons learned and we will try to be responsive to uh, comments and questions that we get via the chat. And also, we may, at certain points, uh, interrupt each other to uh, ask questions and just to emphasize certain matters as we go forward. So why does this matter and, and why are we here? Well, I think that the answer is probably obvious to many of you, but if you just look recently at some of the investment that major companies are making in research and development, along with securing the associated protections for their intellectual property rights, you know, we have some information here where the top five companies, according to NASDAQ, spent a combined $130 billion in 2020 on research and, and development. And that's culminated and thousands of, of patent applications for various entities. Amazon led the league, as it were, in patent applications in, 20, uh, in 2020, and they had 2,200 patents granted. Alphabet or Google was close behind with 1,800 patents. And when we're talking about where the trends are in, in terms of patent activity and intellectual property activity, you're really looking at huge increases in digital related innovation. This is the fastest growing area in patent activity, at least. And it's outpacing other sectors by over 172% in the past five years. The sectors that are the, the subsectors that would fall within this digital related innovation are really being driven by AI, data center technology, predictive technologies, and other digital trends. And I wanna say a word about, also about uh, trademark and copyright, because I think these are less susceptible to international arbitration, but they can in fact exist. I think trademark, we all know the, the sort of usual route for enforcing trademark rights is sending out cease and desist letters in the first instance, and then following up with uh, litigation as needed. Uh, copyright can follow a similar trend. However, these issues do get arbitrated as well. In fact, in my very first international arbitration involving an intellectual property matter, which was a licensing dispute over uh, nuclear technology, the issue in terms of the scope of the license did implicate whether or not the licensee had the right to use the mark and the copyrighted materials of the licensor in that case. And that became uh, very important because the way the materials were, were copyrighted, uh, in fact, led to their utility in terms of the nuclear regulatory process. So we do see those types of issues popping up, although it's less common to have commercial agreements that are gonna provide for the arbitration of trademark and copyrights. So why are parties choosing arbitration or is arbitration popular? Well, it is quite popular internationally. 
Every year, Queen Mary University does a study where they pull arbitration users, and arbitration is consistently ranked as the top choice for in-house counsel for resolving disputes. So 90% of the respondents of this Queen Mary, the most recent Queen Mary University of London survey, listed international arbitration as their preferred mechanism for resolving cross-border disputes. And we're seeing a trend, upward case trends, in all the major international arbitral institutions. They're seeing upward numbers of cases and increasing caseloads in almost each instance. And we're also seeing a lot of reform activity out there on the part of various countries that are updating and modernizing their national arbitration laws. Of course, this has a lot of implication down the road for enforcing arbitration agreements and enforcing arbitration awards. So you want to pay attention to the national laws of the countries at issue where your arbitration might be seated or where your counterparty resides, where you may have to enforce either an arbitration agreement or an arbitration award. But the good news is that the trend has definitely been for countries to modernize and update their national arbitration laws. And many countries are also now promoting their own arbitration centers. Japan has had a big push in recent years, led by the Japanese government, in trying to enhance arbitrations seated in Japan. Uh, we see this in a lot of other places as well, and we see certain states in the United States also trying to prop up their own arbitration centers and to create more of an opportunity for to attract parties to arbitrate within their, within their jurisdiction. So arbitration is definitely quite popular. And, and why? So these are some of the key drivers for choosing international arbitration. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on these just in a general sense. And I know that Wes will also have an opportunity to discuss these more specifically in an IP sense. So... I think number one, uh, why parties choose international arbitration is to avoid the bias of foreign courts so that they can have a neutral forum. Now, there's a lot of inputs that go into drafting the clauses that are not the subject of our presentation here today that can help you enhance your prospects for neutrality and make sure that you really are getting that neutral forum. So that's something that uh, you may want to follow up with at a different time to, to figure out what some of those techniques and tactics you can uh, utilize to really ensure that you are getting the neutrality that arbitration promises. And then having a meaningful say in who hears your dispute, I think that's probably 1A in terms of a key driver. So most arbitration institutions allow you to actually interview your party-appointed arbitrators before you appoint them. And they also, in many instances, allow you in a three-party arbitrator uh, case, they allow you to discuss with your party-appointed arbitrator the attributes that you want in the chair of the tribunal. So you not only have influence on who you're selecting as your party-appointed arbitrator, but you also have substantial influence over who the chair of the tribunal will be. Contrast that with uh, court where it really is the luck of the draw in terms of who you can get in terms of a judge. Enforcement across borders is another key driver. So more than 150 countries are members of the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. And there are many fewer treaties that deal with the reciprocal enforcement of court judgments. So, in fact, the fact that you do have cross-border enforcement of both agreements to arbitrate and arbitration awards is a key driver. Choice of counsel is another key driver. Most jurisdictions are open to attorneys from outside of their jurisdiction to, uh, to conduct arbitrations within their jurisdictions. Definitely want to check up on the national arbitration laws as well as the bar association rules before you do that. But that, that's significant in terms of being able to choose the counsel of your choice, where if you're in court, for example, you may be limited by the rules of the court, and you may have less of an opportunity to really have your preferred counsel.
finality of decision. There are limited appeal rights in arbitration. Arbitration really is customizable. You can do many things with your disputes clauses in order to try to realize the efficiencies of arbitration. Arbitration can be confidential, and the default rule is typically that it is confidential. While there are going to be some exceptions for public companies that have to make mandatory disclosures, generally speaking, arbitration happens outside of the public eye. Now, the ICC now has a default rule where they're trying to uh, make more war awards public and more awards transparent. However, the parties can opt out of that system. The final two bullets here, the speed of resolving the dispute and the reduced cost of resolving the dispute, I'll call those theoretical drivers of arbitration because, in fact, many people complain that arbitration is, in fact, not faster and not as uh, and not cheaper than resorting to court litigation. So with that set up, I'm going to turn this over to my partner, Wes Overson, and put myself on mute here until uh, Wes says something interesting or controversial that I want to uh, chime in on. So, Wes? <laughs> Well, I'm sure to say something interesting right away, Tom, so you better be fast at the trigger there. So, yeah, my name is Wesley Overson. Um, I'm also at uh, Kilpatrick, a partner, and uh, I do patent litigation in courts um, I, and various other IP-related uh, litigation, but I also do quite a bit of arbitration, uh, both on commercial issues and IP issues. And I thought I would start with, like, where... How, how do these things come up and where do they where do they come from? And I would say the number one place where I've seen IP arbitrations come from are settlement agreements. So some, uh, uh, you know, sophisticated international parties, whenever they're in a patent lawsuit, particularly in the United States, and maybe it's in Texas, maybe it's in Delaware, and maybe they don't want to go there again next time. And so when they settle that case, they put in a clause saying, if we have another patent dispute, particularly related to the subject matter of this one, the next one will go into arbitration. So I would say that's the most common way that I've come across IP arbitrations in my career. Uh, the second most common would be in license agreements. So Often a license agreement will have provisions related to royalties have to do with whether there's coverage of products, right? So if you're using our IP, you have to pay a royalty. Often the parties get into dispute uh, whether you're using our IP or not. And those disputes can be directed towards uh, arbitrations. And those uh, I've had, um, I'll talk about this later, particularly in the international world where you you want to kind of resolve everything at once, not just the U.S. issues and the U.S. sales, but everything. Uh, you can do that through arbitration in a way that's much more difficult to do in a U.S. court. So uh, another way is um, M&A contracts. So one company buys another. They're buying IP. Um, they're buying product lines. Um, and there are, ends up being disputes about the IP was the patents actually valid? What did you misrepresent your your IP? Uh, or did these products actually um, infringe in a way that's counter to your representations and warranties in the M and A agreement? And often in M and A contracts, there is a general arbitration provision that would cover the IP related issues that come up going forward. And I would say the least common way I've seen arbitrations uh, in the IP frame is after there's a dispute. So after there's a dispute, it is possible for the parties just to agree, let's avoid the big litigation, and we know what that means and how much uh, distraction and, and money and uh, you know invasiveness and public nature of it all. So let's just agree to take this dispute into an arbitration. Uh, I would say that's the least, um, I haven't seen that many of those, and, and I think that's usually because the plaintiff has filed in some forum where they think there is an edge or an advantage, and they don't want to let the defendant 
go into arbitration and in, a, in an environment where they might be more comfortable. That is uh, generally the, the calculus, but um, I have seen it is possible for the parties just to say, let's go into arbitration and do this another way. And it might be better for both companies. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So when you start off on a, a arbitration, the first thing you look for is what's in the arbitration clause. And, and as Tom said, we're not really here to like go over the, in the details of how to draft an arbitration clause. But I thought, you know, when you're talking about IP arbitration, what's the first thing you do when, you, when something comes up is you look at the arbitration clause and you figure out, okay, what's the seat of the arbitration? Where are we going to be? And obviously, you know, for you, if you're a U.S. company, it's 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 a good thing to have it be somewhere in the U.S. and and you want the governing law to be somewhere in, in, in near your home location. And that's something that's often negotiated whenever the underlying contract um, is entered into, be it a settlement agreement or a license agreement. Um, and um, there's usually a provision for what the procedural rules would be, what's, who's going to administer the arbitration. And there are all kinds of international arbitration um, organizations that can do that for you. The most common, I'd say, is the ICC that I've seen and AAA and JAMS I've seen quite common recently. I did do a CPR one about a decade ago. But all of these different organizations have rules. And, um, you know, again, we could talk about the nuances of them, but really uh, they all help to administer the arbitration and make sure it moves forward and, and, and functions. Um, the arbitration clause decides how many arbitrators usually. It's, there's a, uh, it says whether there's going to be one or three. That's the, the typical setup. Um, but importantly, it, it can talk about the qualifications of the arbitrators, and that can be very important in an IP dispute. And um, I would emphasize that, you know, if you are drafting uh, an arbitration clause that might have to do with IP, you really think about the qualifications that would be desirable and um, make sure you give some thought to the method of selecting the arbitrators, that it's not just a fallback onto the, the typical rules of jams or AAA. Uh, think about those two things because you, you're probably going to want a more sophisticated arbitrator in the subject matter that you anticipate having to deal with. And you can put that in the clause. Um, the amount of discovery is really a key element for uh, all cases, but especially IP cases, um, you, you know, you can have control over the amount of discovery in your case. It's not just like you're in arbitration, therefore you get no discovery. Well, if you, you can get discovery in arbitration, but especially if you put it in the clause, if you describe in the clause what you want to have in the way of discovery, you can control this. You could say, you know, each side will have three depositions. You could say that. I mean, you, you can decide for yourself. So that the arbitration clause is an opportunity to do that. You can also talk about service in an international context. I'll give you an example of this later. It can be really important um, to have an easy way of serving the opposing party. And that can just be put in the arbitration clause so you don't have to go chasing around the world to serve people. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you kind of a pros and cons of arbitration in IP matters. And a lot of the pros, the advantages can be cons for you, depending on which side of the issue you are, and the cons can be pros for you. So it's you have to kind of take your individual case as it comes. But on a general way, let's just say the ability to select arbitrators with specialized knowledge is an advantage. So... Maybe a lot of you have been in the ITC in Washington, D.C., and you might have an administrative law judge who's super smart and knows their stuff in their area, but they might have worked on Social Security matters for a lot of their career and not worked much on patents. Or you might have a, a district court judge who doesn't really like patent cases and doesn't know much about them. So you can avoid all of that by selecting arbitrators who have certain you know, engineering background or have certain... Uh, characteristics or qualifications that make them appropriate for your case. 
And those arbitrators are getting paid by the hour. So guess what? They're willing to work on your case. And um, I'm not trying to be too cynical here, but let's face it, if you're a judge and you have 350 cases on your docket and a complex uh, IP case comes across uh, your desk or the bench, uh, you know, it's difficult to spend a lot of time on those cases. And whereas the arbitrators will spend the time on it. I think, I think that's a benefit that's not often discussed, but it's super important. An arbitrator will take the time to read your papers and understand the case. Um, you can uh, de decide how you want the process to work. Usually you try and do this with the other side. Sometimes that doesn't work, but then you get in a hearing with the arbitrators and it's often a very simple process of talking about, well, what, are you, what does this side want? What does that side want? And you can get those arbitrators often on the phone on short notice within a few days often. And you can have things resolved on an ongoing basis in a customized way to your case rather than in a cookie cutter way, which is what, tends to happen more in district court. You know, Tom said, you know, sometimes arbitration isn't faster and it isn't cheaper, but my experience would still be that the general rule applies. It doesn't apply every time, but generally because of the limitations on discovery and arbitration in particular, uh, you're not going to have the um, scorched earth email type uh, discovery that you have often in courts that ends up being costing millions of dollars. You usually do not have that in arbitration. And so the ultimate outcome is that it, it is um, somewhat cheaper in my experience. And Wes, um, just, just to drop a, a footnote here, there is a lot of activity right now by the various arbitral institutions. And there's also actually a UN UNCITRAL working group right now that has members from countries all over the world and their whole their whole emphasis is on trying to make arbitration more efficient and also provide for expedited arbitration in in appropriate cases so there really is an effort to reclaim the faster and cheaper idea even though you know i i poo-pooed it a little bit but uh, just wanted to drop that footnote Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so in general, you don't have the uh, as many motions and disclosures and contentions, and you don't have uh, 18 month stays because someone's going to do a inter partes review in Washington, D.C. on a patent. You have less of that. The arbitrators are focused on getting a schedule sticking to the schedule and although there are some it's not like there are no motions in arbitration there are but there's certainly less um confidentiality can be really important in ip cases and and that's a i think a rather you know important advantage of arbitration that the the entire arbitration could happen without any of your other competitors um even knowing that it's going on um, so if your patents are being challenged, um, et cetera, you, you don't always want to have that all play out in a public forum. Um, you, there are less uh, appeals. I'll talk to you in a minute about a case I had where there was an arbitration that provided for an arbitrated appeal. Uh, so you can, uh, you can provide for a confidential arbitration appeal uh, in your arbitration clause, but in general, arbitration rulings are are pretty final and if they're, they're very difficult to challenge uh, on them on the merits and uh, so that is an advantage as well uh, international resolution enforceability Tom already discussed uh, there's broad acceptance of arbitration awards and although you hear every once in a while a, um, a bad story about an arbitrator who issued an award that somebody's really angry about uh, in general uh, you don't have the as many of these runaway type um, jury verdicts that we hear about all the time in the United States. Um, you know, where a jury has just accepted some experts $400 million figure or whatever. The arbitrators tend to really, really analyze the numbers 
and get the numbers right. I mean, I'm not saying they're always ones you like, but they're going to be careful about it and they're going to be reasoned about it. So that I think that's an advantage um, for particularly for defendants. So um, what are some of the disadvantages? And again, these disadvantages can be advantages depending on what side of the coin you're on in a given case. Some people complain that there isn't enough discovery. Um, you know, if you need discovery in arbitration, you go to the arbitrators and say, I need usually called disclosures or, you know, maybe you don't use the same terminology as in court, but you can get what you really need. But the arbitrators are usually not going to give you the full scope of what you, you would get in court. So some people would rather have that, um, uh, you know, full discovery, but uh, I think most of you know in the rest of the world, there's no one ha that really has discovery like in the U.S. So the international players don't want to have U.S. discovery applicable, and that, that's part of the reason they, they go towards international arbitration. So I've generally been able to get what I need in terms of discovery and arbitrations, but uh, not always everything I want. <laughs> um, you don't uh, get all the local patent rules disclosures in an arbitration. You can ask for that. You can ask the other side to agree to it, and sometimes they will if you really want it. But you don't have a matter of right, like you file a case in Northern District of California. There's kind of a local rules that click in and decide the whole uh, pretrial procedures. So there is kind of a formality to that. And um, some people don't like that in arbitration, it's, it's more um, customized. Um, you know, if you want to uh, stop a case by filing an inter parties review or, or through a summary judgment motion, that is more likely to happen in a court as opposed to an arbitration, where the arbitrator kind of sees their role as moving the case along and not stopping and staying things, getting the things resolved. Um, there's a lot less live witness testimony in arbitrations. A lot of times, the, the, the especially international, like ICC arbitration, the direct testimony is provided on paper. So a lot of people like that. A lot of people say that's a big advantage because then, you know, they don't, the case isn't like subject to their witness tripping up and forgetting something or whatever. But, um, uh, you know, if you want your witness to be able to testify for hours at a time, that's on direct, that's likely not going to happen in an arbitration. Um, arbitration is often criticized for the split the baby result where the arbitrators kind of do what they think is fair and reach a, uh, a result that's somewhat in the middle between what the parties want. And I have seen that, but I've also seen several arbitration results where they're not split the baby. And um, I've also seen split the baby results where the arbitrators have done a very clever and good job at reaching what is fair and right. So um, split the baby is often a pejorative term, like the arbitrators aren't doing their job, but I have often seen them reach a fair result by balancing things in the end. So again, some people think this is a disadvantage. I know um, I've had a case where there was f I was the defendant and there were five patents brought against us in arbitration and we won all on all five. So I have had complete one-sided results where we got, you know, and Tom, I know um, you've, you've had the same. Yeah. Just um, a couple comments on this slide. If I, if I could, yeah, I've, I've definitely had some lopsided, victories in arbitration so my experience with the the split the baby is is that in practice if you have a, a strong case and and you are able to you know overwhelm the other side with your arguments total victory is possible and in that sense you're often looking at uh, fee shifting provisions as well where if you do have a decisive victory you're also going to be returned your uh, your legal fees as a part of any award. On the on the document disclosure or discovery, just uh, two quick points. One is that oftentimes 
arbitrators suffer from what they call due process paranoia. So if, in fact, the case has a lot of money at stake and there's, you know, a huge claim, the arbitrators may err on the side of ordering more document disclosure or discovery than may be typical in most cases. And just the final point on discovery is if you look at the U.S. standards where it's very broad, you know, essentially you're entitled to any document that is relevant or may lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So it's a very broad standard. Whereas in arbitration, the typical standard that is applied is the IBA rules on the taking of evidence. And where those differ is that, in fact, you have to show not only that the document is relevant in order to obtain it, but you also have to show that the document is material to the outcome of the dispute. So you can see if you're applying those uh, International Bar Association rules on the taking of evidence, you have a much narrower default standard. And there's even a trend Recently, there is the Prague Rules, which were uh, sponsored by a number of civil law practitioners, where they even take that standard and tighten it up even further and offer a presumption of no electronic discovery. So those are things that you can address in your arbitration clauses or, or at the, you know, the, the pre-hearing conferences that Wes was alluding to. So thanks, Wes, for letting me comment on this. Okay, so as you probably know, you can't go to the federal circuit uh, if you uh, you know don't like the patent award um, uh, in arbitration. Uh, I put on here harder to get injunction. It's getting pretty hard in 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 courts to get an injunction in IP cases uh, uh, unless you have a really really uh, you know really really strong case. Um, but you can, you know, of course you could take your arbitration award and, and, and use it to enforce it and get an injunction. It's, 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 a, it's a, another step. And then, um, in terms of settlement, you know, a lot of times cases settle because of the burden of litigation. Like if you get a filing and you're in the, you don't want to be in the Western district of Texas and you know, what's coming there and, and the case sometimes settle right away, just from the overwhelming nature of what's coming and the lack of faith in the outcome. And I found that the cases who are in arbitration, the parties are more comfortable with arbitrators and they often, they have a little bit more tendency to, to get decided. Um, so you have to think if you're in an arbitration, you, you can't count on it. I mean, most arbitrations settle just like court cases, but um, there's more of a chance of it going. And you have to think about that. If, you, if you're confronted with an arbitration, there's more of a chance of it making it through to the end because the parties aren't as afraid of the arbitrators as they are of juries. So um, I think the next one, I'm not getting my next slide, Tom, and I think that's because now it's the poll question. And do I need to do something on that? <laughs> yeah, that's CLE verification. So I think you can just advance it, Wes. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, so I thought uh, a better, you know, we could talk in general about arbitration in the abstract um, and the advantages and disadvantages of IP uh, related arbitration. But I thought it would be good to talk about real examples because it kind of brings it to life a little better and makes you see uh, how it works. So one of the uh, larger cases that I did uh, stemmed from a settlement agreement between biotech companies and they settled a very uh, contentious case that had been filed in court. And as part of that settlement, one of the companies was European one was a U.S. company. And as part of that um, settlement, they put into the settlement, you know, here's what's going to happen if in this subject matter we're going to have um, any other disputes in the future. 
So there was a listing, there was a way of determining which of the patent families would absolutely have to go into arbitration. And then there was kind of a broader catch-all of if you're any dispute amongst the companies having to do with this top, the subject matter would go into arbitration. And they put in there in the settlement agreement that if one of the, if the one of the companies had was found to be using the other company's uh, IP, there was a royalty rate, rate that was preset. So there wasn't, you didn't have a fight in the arbitration about what the royalty rate would be. It was already in the settlement agreement. So uh, the issue was the infringement and validity of any of the new patents that either of the companies were to receive. So um, in that matter, uh, our client actually received the new patent. So we were the claimant, you know, the plaintiff in court, but claimant in arbitration. And um, we agreed on a retired federal judge. It was a New York-based um, arbitration. Uh, New York law applied, and there was a New York seat for the arbitration, so that's where the hearing would be. And um, this uh, federal judge came in. There was only one patent, and the judge didn't have any Markman or summary judgment motions. The parties weren't pushing too hard on that. But he decided, like, I can deal with this all together in one proceeding. You, you brief it all together. And we filed our, our pre-hearing briefs. To give you a sense of what, you know, when this works well, how it works, that we came to the hearing in New York, both sides represented by, you know, good lawyers, I think. Um, and uh, during our opening statement to the arbitrator, uh, it was a single arbitrator. He stopped us at one point and said, that's the point you were making in footnote seven on page 10 of your brief. And he did that to show that's how well he knew our papers. That's how well he knew the case. He, he wanted us to know both sides that he had studied this and that he was on, even though it had to do with, you know, DNA related uh, technology he understood it and was ready to go. And, um, you know, both sides, I think, benefit from that. The confidence of knowing your decision maker knows what's happening and it's not going to be influenced by extraneous things. Uh, the arbitration all had to do with what mattered on a technical level in the case and, and a legal level in the case. It didn't have to do with who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, who's wearing a white hat, who's not. You know, it had to do with... Um, substantive issues in a positive way. Uh, and then I thought the, the clever thing the arbitrator did is in the final argument, he tipped his hand at the end, which way he was going to go, which allowed the parties to settle the case the way they wanted. So ultimately, instead of um, him just writing an, uh, an award where, you know, we would have to live with the way it was written. Instead, he said, here's the way I'm going to go. And based on all of your arguments, I've considered everything, but you might want to figure out your way of doing this in a settlement rather than waiting for me to, to, to rule. And it actually ended up better for both sides because we figured out a way that worked for everybody's accounting and everybody's, you know, overall system. And, and, and it was uh, quite a good result. Um, for my clients, so of course, I was happy, but also for both sides, I think, in the end. So uh, another case. Um, so again, this was in the, um, I, would, I guess I would say pharma space. Um, there was a license agreement. Uh, it, it discussed what would happen if future patents issued amongst that if one side got a patents or the other and they thought that there was an uh, infringement issue, then uh, there would be an arbitration to address it. And these were two relatively large companies who knew each other and then fought each other in the past. And uh, the arbitration was on infringement and validity. Um, once again, there was already royalty rates that were had been established by the license agreement, so you didn't have to fight so much about damages. Um, it was really a question of infringement and validity. And this clause said 
the arbitrators who will decide this case will be uh, qualified in, um, in patent law, have experience in this area. You know, it was basically a pharma related area. And, and it, there was specific indications of who the arbitrator should be. There's three arbitrators and each, uh, uh, each side picked one and then they picked the third, but they had uh, very good directions as to who we were looking for, who both sides were looking for. Uh, again, we, when we got there to the hearing, uh, the arbitrators made it very clear to us they knew what the issues were and which issues they wanted evidence on. So it wasn't just you get to the hearing and you go through the whole thing again that you've already put in your briefs. They know the briefs. They've read the briefs. They know what matters. And they told us, here's what we want from you. So it, it creates an efficiency there. And um, this one was a little unusual because uh, the clause actually said, if they're at the end of the award, there can be an appeal. And the appeal will be decided by another three arbitrator panel. So you go, this is obviously, there was a lot at stake, right? So they, there was a three arbitrator panel this was all CPR was the name of the administering agency. And so we got an, a, a, a panel of mostly they were retired patent litigator types or patent prosecutor types or in-house counsel that worked in the IP departments. And um, they were our appellate panel. In the end, the case settled right before it was the day of the argument, uh, oral argument in that appellate uh, proceeding. But you can do an appeal if you really want one in arbitration. Uh, you will have to uh, pay for the arbitrators, or the losing party will have to pay for those arbitrators. But uh, you can get a appellate hearing. Okay, so uh, example West, number three. West, yeah. we just had we had a question, which I I think you know all of your slides here talk about uh, arbitrating the issue of validity of the patent. And the question is, from one of our attendees, is what's your experience in limiting arbitration to specific issues? And it looks like the issue they're concerned about here is actually not allowing arbitrators to make binding decisions on patent validity because of the concern that that might lead to an unappealable, an unappealable ruling that destroys the value of an entire uh, patent portfolio. So do you have a a comment on that question? Yeah, I do. Uh, yes, you can You can provide for that. Uh, I had a case that didn't exactly do that. And actually, um, let me, oh yeah, here we are, we're here. So actually, apropos example number three uh, is, is closely related to that. In that case, uh, the, company that wrote the arbitration clause basically provided that invalidity was off the table. So it was a clever way of doing it by saying, you know, um, and, and unless a patent is found valid by a court or, and had gone through all of the appeals in, a, in your U S jurisdiction, you couldn't argue, you couldn't argue in validity. It, it was a, they did it in a clever way, um, and of course you couldn't go to court against the other party because there was an arbitration clause. So someone else would have had to push the case all the way through to the Supreme Court in the U.S. and have that be patent be finally one hundred percent declared invalid, or else you couldn't bring it up. And uh, that's the way they did it in that case. But uh, I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Um, just say, we will have an arbitration that will be limited to consideration of infringement. And um, again, there's a confidentiality uh, of arbitrations. So that helps as well with your concern, I think, of hurting the entire portfolio through an invalidity ruling. Um, so I, that is an option and you can customize your arbitration clause for that. Uh, but you'll have to put it in the clause. You know, you can't wait to get to the arbitration and then try and do that. Um, but
But anyway, this example number three that I have on the screen is uh, uh, one of these where um, our, my client w uh, terminated a license. They were paying a substantial sum to a European company because they felt like the European company had um, uh, double patented uh, the uh to the extent where there's, so the remaining patents in the U.S. that they're paying on were not valid because they were just covering the same subject matter of patents that had already expired. And that was their main reason for terminating. And of course, the European company, the licensor didn't agree with that. And they filed an ICC arbitration in Europe to keep those royalties going. And um, this was impressive. I, th I thought that the European ICC panel, they were all educated in European uh, patent law, but they understood U U.S. I was amazed how well they understood U.S. law and U.S. law applied to the patent that's ever at issue. And they actually had a full tutorial the way we would in the U.S. and they had a Markman hearing. And because we explained to them that they needed to understand that and they agreed to do it. And um, so we flew over there and we did those proceedings separate from the actual hearing um, and the invalidity issue ended up not prevailing, uh, because of the contractual language. I probably can't go into it more detail than that, but basically the arbitrators decided based on this contract, we can't rule for you on invalidity. They didn't reach the merits of validity. They didn't say the patents are valid, but they said, we can't reach it based on the way this contract is written. And, um, however, they uh, gave a, a, a good ruling for us on non-infringement. And so it was a split result. And some people would say, oh, that split the baby. I don't like that. But actually, it was good. Again, it was a good result for both parties in many ways. Um, it, it was a fair, fair result. Uh, I'll try and move a little quicker now. Example number four. So I, I've seen cases where the one company buys another company and they think they're getting IP rights that they didn't, didn't actually get. So there are uh, usually reps and warranties in these agreements. And um, so uh, uh, there's also, in, in this one, an example number four, it specifically there was agreements as to where you could use your IP in, in, in this related market or that related market. They kind of split up the market amongst the two companies. And in this case, there was a big dispute about who could use what IP in which market. And, and again, that would be a difficult case in front of a jury. It'd be a difficult case for a judge because it was very complicated as to who had which markets and how much IP went to one party or the other, or which ones they shared. And, it, it was a difficult uh, matter, but we had three very intelligent arbitrators and uh, they sorted it out. And they sorted it out in a way that kind of made the parties reach a settlement afterwards. They gave you know each side something in a rational way, uh, not an arbitrary way, uh, that, that it resulted in a settlement shortly after the ruling. And then my last example is one where um, this is the one where they truly were representing the uh, IP rights. It turned out that the uh, I represented the larger company that acquired a smaller company, and the smaller company had said that they owned all of this IP. There wasn't a lot of due diligence done, but they had um, reps and warranties of, regarding the IP. And they, it turned out that basically they had developed a lot of this IP for other companies that had claims to it. So they didn't actually own the rights to the IP that they said that they did. And so, um, uh, this, uh, my client refused to make the last, it was a large payment and they refused to make that last payment. And the, um, the opponent, you know, the, the smaller company that had misrepresented their IP came after they filed the arbitration saying we want our payment. And we came back and said, wait a minute, this was actually fraudulent. They, they didn't really own the IP. And um, so we won on that counterclaim. But again, uh, not an easy issue for a jury um, 
or even a busy judge. And it, it was uh, successfully managed by one single arbitrator who had some, you know, decent uh, IP experience. Okay, I guess I do have one more example, and this one I'll go quickly. This is a, just making the point that you can get to the royalties worldwide through an arbitration. You can have one hearing and resolve royalty claims against another company across the entire planet altogether in one place if you have an arbitration clause in your license agreement. And I've been doing this for companies who have been going after manufacturers in Asia um, who are not paying as much royalties as they should. Even, and even though they don't have that many sales in the U.S., we can resolve the whole thing in the California arbitration uh, because they agreed to an arbitration clause in the license agreement. And so it's a, it, it is actually a very efficient way to reach, you know, a global uh, resolution through one proceeding that could be close to home if you're, you know, if you put your arbitration clause, if you set your arbitration clause near your home. Uh, the one thing I will point out there is make sure you provide for some kind of email service. We had a, you know, you, you can have difficulties serving companies. This, is, this applies in court as well, by the way, trying to serve uh, Chinese companies in um, court or in arbitration can be a challenge if you don't. But in arbitration, you can deal with that through the clause. You can provide for a simple email service. Okay, so uh, in general, you know, you can have a worldwide resolution instead of going and having fights in a bunch of different countries. Um you can get more sophisticated decision makers in arbitration. My experience, you're going to get faster to decision and you can control how fast it goes a lot better than you can in court. Overall, uh, you have a lot more uh, feeling of participation in the way the, the events of the case go because the arbitrators will listen to you. It's not a cookie cutter approach. And ultimately the discovery is more limited, which is generally better for both sides. Um, and I find in general, there's a more fair result from arbitration. You don't have the delays of the IPRs that we often see in our parties reviews, the stays related to those that we see all the time in litigation now. Um, you have less procedural contentions and motions in arbitration. And overall, the, 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 the lack of appeals, the less discovery, the overall enforceability abroad, all of those uh, really favor uh, arbitration over a court approach. So um, if you're a uh, uh, respondent, a, def a defendant, accused infringer, um, you know, you have a decent shot at invalidity in, in front of our smart arbitrators. And you might like the less discovery. You, you might not have your inter parties review delays that you get in court, but your overall damage risk is gonna be lower. And I think you're gonna have a better shot at achieving a reasonable result in, in a confidential form. So, uh, Tom, I wanted to leave at least five minutes in case there's any questions, so maybe I should stop now. Yeah, if folks want to put questions in the chat. We did have one question that came over ahead of time, which is, you know, are there any courts, are there any U.S. jurisdictions that you might prefer to be in court rather than in arbitration? For me, the answer is usually not. Uh, however, I know there is some specialty expertise, maybe in the federal circuit and you know other places. So, what's your comment on that, Wes? Well, in general, you know, patent cases have ended up getting bunched in Texas and Delaware. You know, there's uh, where, but it, I haven't seen that as much in trademark cases. I'm not a trademark specialist by any means, but you see a lot more cases in you know, the Northern District of California for trademark or New York or LA. And um, I don't think there is as much of a um, 
kind of a plaintiff's advantage by filing in some uh, more distant, maybe rural venue where the jurors are, 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 are otherwise inclined or the judges are anti-defendant, you know? So I, I don't think that there is a much of an advantage to the plaintiffs of filing in peculiar venues for, for trademark cases. Um, but again, a lot of the trademark cases are cease and desist letters and then filing for TROs and they, they tend to get resolved faster in court as opposed to the patent cases, which drag on and on and on. So, so there's yeah, a little bit more, there's a little bit more I, I, I see. And, and obviously, uh, Tom, there's less like. McDonald's did not know in advance that someone was going to call a restaurant McSushi, you know, <laughs> like someone did here in San Francisco. So you wouldn't have an arbitration clause in play there, right? Yeah, that's right. I think it's a lot less likely just just in general for those types of issues. And And the question did come up in the trademark context, so I think that's good. You know, um, we just had another one uh come come across here as well you know how do you pick a good arbitrator and you know usually both sides might have a hard time compromising so what are some strategies that you've utilized you know i think that if you have a single arbitrator it's definitely harder to come up with a a compromise pick where both parties are going to agree. But, you know, I've had some success with uh, where you can agree on a pool of candidates and then you can rank them and then, you know, fail. And we often do that for selecting the chair. And so, you know, if you come up with five candidates and then you rank them accordingly, then, you know, the highest ranked candidate from that group is going to be, you know, jointly highest ranked candidate from that group is going to be the one that's selected, uh, you know, and for, for, if you're party appointed arbitrator, you know, I, I think you really do your diligence. I mean, you, you get recommendations from your colleagues, you get recommendations from people that, you know, you, you may have past experiences with some arbitrators and you do your diligence, you talk to them, where the rules allow you to, which many of them do. And you try to get a sense, not on the substance, you want to avoid the substance, but you try to get a sense of their past experience, whether they have the specialized knowledge that you're looking for, what their discovery philosophies are, document disclosure philosophies, what other um, ways that they would try to make the hearing more efficient and, and things of that nature. Uh, Wes, what do you do to try to pick a good arbitrator? Yeah, those are good uh, suggestions. Uh, in terms of IP, if you look at people's qualifications, just online, almost all the arbitrators list their qualifications, and they almost all say that they have a lot of intellectual property experience in California, at least. Maybe that's not national, but in California, where I practice, they all say they have. And I find that um, if you're talking about a single arbitrator, usually I would get with the opposing counsel and we'll both call if there's somebody that is in play, we can call together. Sometimes you can call on your own, but you can call together. And a lot of times you can find out pretty quickly whether they really understand IP issues or not. Because a lot of times, they, you know, what people call IP is pretty loose. And you'll find out that people don't really have that much experience. Um, so I think you have to be pretty skeptical to find an arbitrator in an IP case that you know, it has enough experience. Um, in my experience, the, you know, the retired litigators in IP are very qualified. A lot of times people want the judges, the retired judges, because they have kind of a aura about them, right? But in my experience, the retired litigators are the ones who are in the trenches and really focused on IP, and they're your better choice. So, and, you know, as much as we don't like that arbitration practice is kind of a clubby environment, you, you do have to know some members of the club and you have to call around 
and get people's, you know, reactions to different candidates. So I, I try and come up with a shorter list myself, and then I call around to people I know, people like Tom, and say, yeah. what do you think of these people? And, you know, after enough legwork, you can come up with a decent list. And if you're in the club, then you use that to your advantage, too. So, you know, that that's certainly something that, you know, arbitration does have that reputation of being clubby but you know if you're in the club that can work to your advantage so i think that that's something that you know uh woody allen's remarks aside about never wanting to be in a club that would accept him as a member it does have some advantages here and you know i would just say i would give one example another example of a selecting an arbitrator we had a case in southern california or i had a case uh, a few years ago, which was a huge case, and it involved the design of a nuclear power plant. And so there we were really looking for someone that had a reputation of being meticulous, who would really get into the the facts because we were defending our, our quality assurance process and our design review process for a nuclear component. So we did a lot of diligence in that case of trying to find the right person who could really, um, you know, put aside all of the hyperbole and all the, you know, uh, purple pros that the other side was using and really just get into the, the guts of the case and to understand that our technology was, was good technology. I think we have run our time if there are, no other questions. We're right at uh, an hour and, and one minute here in terms of our presentation. So, you know, I'd like to thank Wes for his great insights. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining. And of course, we are uh, available if folks want to reach out to us and, and follow up on any of any of these matters. So thanks so much for giving us your time today. Thank you. Appreciate it.